Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. Ooh. My name is Mark, and on today's episode of Collider Movie Talk, Avatar gets effects, Blade Runner gets a new composer, and Bumblebee tangles with the king of tuna. Ashley, <laughs> who's joining me today? Also here is John Schnell. Yeah, an all political special edition of Movie Talk. <laughs> Getting totally into it. Nitty gritty, dirty politics, right? I also hear Clark Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not doing that, but it's nice to see you. Thank you guys for having me. Also here, John Roca. Hey, everybody. I like that my spider fingers are climbing out of Ashley Mova's head from behind her. Like, I didn't know I had look alien at, look fingers. At the look at those things. Yeah. Those that are one. scary. Um, those creepy are, digits. You ever seen, uh, was it, uh, War of the Worlds? It looks like my fingers that. are coming out of the spaceship. <laughs> there those you are go. very, very spindly <laughs> hands from the outlaw. I'm a man, damn it. Look, you know, we give the outlaw a lot. We, we joke around here a lot in the studio, but sometimes we do have accomplishments we want to share with all of you the world at large and one of those happened yesterday collider videos youtube channel passed 300 million views that's, pretty, uh, yeah. that's a lot of that's a lot of at 600 million eyeballs and i would like to say uh that i can take credit for 38 of those views thanks mom <laughs> appreciate all your support over the years yeah, we Mark, have a lot of fun stories to get to today. you know what's crazy it's like i think uh just in the last month we've got a 25 percent uptick in viewers We've had a lot of yeah. percentage, and I don't want to say all of that is because of John Roca's spindly fingers. But spindly fingers. Did, uh, God help so us. show us the fingers one more time. Yeah, I mean, seriously. Look at those. Oh, oh my God. God. Scary. That's a 22% increase wow. right there. I don't have thumbs. This is what I do. <laughs> is that a movie pundit or one of the aliens from Signs? <laughs> Let's kick off our first story of the day where we won't be talking about aliens, or maybe there will be them in Bumblebee. <laughs> Paramount Pictures announced yesterday the release date and full cast list for their upcoming Transformers spinoff entitled Bumblebee. They powers at the studio are looking to take the franchise in a new direction. Hiring Kubo and the two strings Helmer Travis Knight to breathe life into the franchise and they will be doing so just in time for Christmas. Bumblebee is now set to be released on December 21st, 2018. The same day as DC's Aquaman and four days before Disney's Mary Poppins Returns. Along with confirming the time set in the year of 1987 taking place in a small Californian beach town where Haley Steinfeld's Charlie character discovers a battle Scarred and Broken Bumblebee, the studio also announced the full cast list, which includes John Cena. Mark, thoughts on the release date and addition of John Cena to Bumblebee? Well, I actually love the addition of John Cena to the Bumblebee movie. This is one of those, like, Transformers films in the franchise that we're secretly holding out some hope for because a certain director is not helming this movie where we instead have the great storyteller behind Kubo and the Two Strings. And it's like, oh, okay, we could have something fun, original, fresh with actually a good sense of humor and maybe we get to focus more on storyline versus selling Bud Light to people all over the world. <laughs> but you also have Michael Bay will be producing it, so you can't, you have to temper those expectations a little bit. But somebody like John Cena, where it's unfair to compare anybody's career to to what The Rock has done from a post-wrestling standpoint. But John Cena has clearly shown an ability to have a lot of personality, a lot of charisma, some acting chops, and some humor in there, too, in movies like Trainwreck, where he's popped in and been pretty good. So I like the fact that he is in the Bumblebee movie. It remains to be seen exactly what kind of role he is. And the cast list that Ashley just rattled off on the whole, I think, is an impressive lineup for Bumblebee. The release date, Clark, is something that I think is... a I would be a little nervous right now if I was the Bumblebee movie because you have two characters from beloved or very popular franchises mm -hmm. that are getting their own spin-off movies. I just think there is so much heat on Aquaman right now that everybody's so excited about what Jace Momoa is going to be bringing to the Justice League and then obviously his own standalone movie. So if this was, say, even uh, as recent as a year ago, I would say, oh, Aquaman, I don't know about that. But Momoa coming to play in every appearance he's made and all the footage that we've seen from Aquaman so far. He drove a parrot demon through a building <laughs> and he sucked <laughs> out. And that was awesome. We have yet to see Bumblebee have that kind of clamor. So do you think this is a wise move opening against Aquaman? Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I mm. just realistically don't mm -hmm. think it's going to happen. I think if Aquaman keeps that date, then Bumblebee will move. Um, and uh, because it's the, can the audience cannibalizes each other. I think, you know, studios do this all the time. They stick dates on a calendar, but ultimately they shift things around. Paramount shifts things 
things around all the time. I mean, I know Paranormal Activity is not the same, but like they've moved those dates around with the last couple installments of that franchise, like I'd say three or four times. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I am, you know, look, the cast that they've assembled for Bumblebee is great. And um, we were all excited for Kubo and the Two Strings. I like that it's set in the 80s. I think that's mm -hmm. really fun right. and, and could have a really great um, like nostalgic vibe to it. So, I mean, everything is is looking awesome for this movie and I want to see this movie but if I was a betting woman uh, if Aquaman stays Bumblebee goes that's right now Schnapp, uh, it does take place in 1987 so you know Bumblebee who loves to talk through the car radio uh -huh. there's gonna be some good tunes mm -hmm. during that movie will we have that versus Aquaman as a choice coming that Christmas well let me say Atomic Blonde I saw that last week and it had a great soundtrack and it was incredible action scenes. The rest of the movie, you know, give or take, it's an average, uh, you know, spy film. It wasn't horrible. I actually liked it. A lot yeah, of people sure. were like poo pooing it. I thought it was fun, but, you know, 87 Bumblebee driving around, I mean, that's a great year for music. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Also, Kubo and the, t uh, the Two Strings, you might have the Bumblebee stop motion activity happening. Mm. So I think it's good to have somebody who has that kind of capability and artistry to be involved in it, which hasn't been involved in any of the other Transformers movies. Sorry, Roka. But, um, <laughs> you know, I just feel like this might be the first uh, Transformers movie that I actually want to see. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm starting to get a little excited for Bumblebee, and the, the addition of John Cena certainly helps that. So I'm in the fortunate position, Roka, where hopefully by the time that movie comes out, I will get to see both that and Aquaman before Christmas. Which movie do you go to see if you are presented with those options at the multiplex? I'll be honest with you. And I know I've defended Transformers multiple times. I go see Aquaman first. Sure. Honestly, I think Jason Momoa has been killing it. He is the one person that is standing out from all the cast. Of course, Gal Gadot, she's already established, but she's the one person that I really enjoy in the Justice League trailers. And he was great at the Hall H panel at Comic Con. Really got the crowd psyched up and got everybody going. So, like you said, Jason, him, uh, Mark, rather, him going through and through that building coming out is one of the best parts of the trailer. So, I'm excited for that. This being said, I, what I like about the Bumblebee approach is that it almost feels, if you can say this, like a smaller independent movie approach. Because if you're going to do an Optimus Prime movie, then you bring all the big hitters, you make it huge, you cast it huge. But this is a smaller cast. Haley Stanfield, she has a, a, a carbon footprint, but it isn't a big one in movies. Mm -hmm. But it's always, but it is a good one, you know. And uh, the Edge of Seventeen one that right. she just did, great buzz. And Travis Knight, obviously with Kubo and the Two Strings. Pamela Adlon is someone you do not see headlining a lot of movies. So to see her coming on this is great as well. And John Cena, I think, is a great choice was coming off the work he did on Doug Lyman's The Wall, what we're hearing the work he did that was great on there, and then, of course, what, what you mentioned earlier uh, with uh, Trainwreck, great stuff that he's slowly building it. See, the Rock, they may not always be The Rock, but they follow The Rock's pattern. Batista as well. Smaller stuff, smaller stuff, build to where you get to a point where you can be a lead, see what you can do. What I'm worried about here is Paramount, does Paramount have an issue with with uh, with DC? Because, like, they they made, they missed the Warner, but, like, are they, are they a jilted X or something? Because they're like, they made the to move the Wonder Woman uh, release date because they put Transformers 5 there. They wouldn't let Henry Cavill shave his mustache for, for Mission Impossible 6 when he came back to just So they got into all this CG stuff to take it off. And now this. So I'm just wondering if there's some hidden issues going on between these two, these two studios. Yeah, what's going on, man? I mean, look, I, I agree with Clark in that if there is one of the movies that is going to move off this release date eventually, it's going to be Bumblebee yeah. because Aquaman and Justice League as a whole have too much momentum right now that you don't want to mess with that if you're studio like Paramount trying to launch Transformers in a very different light. Let's not forget the last night. Very successful abroad but here in the States it was by far the weakest of the Transformers movies from a box office perspective so right. far so I think that they do want to have some goodwill moving towards that and maybe an easier release date. I love that the movie takes place in 1987. Here's my, my lead pipe lock of songs that you're going to get in the Bumblebee movie because <laughs> it takes place in 1987. Michael Jackson's bad. Whitney mm. Houston, I want to dance with somebody and Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the jungle lead pipe lock it put your kids through private school with that bet <laughs> speaking of bets our own cody hall had his birthday yesterday and, uh, he, uh, he decided to go to vegas and he uh he put 50 dollars on the roulette table and he won because cody's catchphrase is always bet on black nice. all right let's move on to our next story <laughs> ashley what do we got yesterday variety confirmed that visual effects studio weta digital has begun working on the four sequels to james cameron's avatar the new zealand based shot most recently did the effects and motion capture work on War for the Planet of the Apes, 
with director James Cameron praising the digital house for their work on the Ape sequel, as well as teasing that since the company has only gotten better since the original Avatar, it now means they can push the effects work even further. With production underway, fans will have to wait until December 18, 2020 to finally see Avatar 2 11 years after the original hit theaters. Schnepp, thoughts on Avatar 2 and its sequels finally starting production at What Up? Well, I mean, we have to sometimes wait many years, Independence Day 2, Regurgence, or whatever that was called. <laughs> sometimes you have sequels coming out 30 years later, Blade Runner 2049, which I have high hopes for. Yeah. And you have this, which is 11 years later. I don't think it was it wanted to be 11 years later. It, I think it wanted to be seven years later. But then due to technology and, and Cameron's desire to do certain things and, and shoot for the moon, he just started you know pushing everything to try to shoot all four films together. First, I think it was three. Then there's a fourth one. I think it's a great idea. Like, we have to make sure the first one is good. But going from James Cameron's record so far, if you look at his filmography, he's pretty much batting, you know, I'd say 90% out of 100. Maybe there's one miss in the, in the, in the hole. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I don't mind waiting this many years. There's a lot of other movies and other things like, you know, a f the thousand movies on streaming, you know, that I can't even catch up on and just start watching Ozark. What's up? So, you know, look, I can wait another day. If it was 15 years, I wouldn't care. As long as it, we get four avatars in a row and they're all amazing. And from what I keep hearing, all of us have friends in the business. What they're doing over in the studios over here in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Hollywood is incredible. Mm. I mean, it's going to break the, the bar of all special effects. So I think seeing the, the seeing it in 3D, like the first avatar, having to wait all these many, these many years, the upgrade in special effects, what we're going to see in the world that he's going to take us to, I can't wait. Yeah, did you guys see that little blue bird that flew in right before we went live and was telling us about how James Cameron has uh, has worked with WET and now they have this like underwater rig and it's the first rig that you can shoot in total digital and it's like, it's going to be, and if there's one guy that knows how to go underwater and shoot a lot of things, yeah. it is Mr. James Cameron. I mean, this whole story feels kind of like a ribbon cutting, Clark. It's like, hey, we, we wet, WET is back and um, they've been doing a lot of good stuff, so we don't really have anything to show you yet, but it's a fun announcement i will say this if you give weta 10 years you give any effects company 10 years you can make leaps i mean look at what jurassic park did in 93 and then look at where we were with some of those star wars movies with uh you know i probably attack of the clones mm -hmm. or revenge of the sith coming out about 10 years later and there's technological leaps that you can make in a company like weta where we've actually gotten to track their progress from all the apes movies it's like it's incredible i mean you go see war for the planet of the apes and it's mind-blowing so if they can take another small step from that in a different direction and bring us back to the world of Avatar, it's time to get excited. And I'm looking at you guys in the chat room and a lot of y'all are like, okay, whatever, call us when we actually have footage. And I agree with you guys. I wanna see this too, but this is enough to start to get me to say, you know what? I, I could be on board for a bunch of new Avatar movies. Well, let's think about Terminator. There was about 10 years in between Terminator and Terminator oh, right. 2. Um, Cameron is in no hurry, for better or for worse. <laughs> and uh, but I but so so uh, you know when it comes to James Cameron, he takes his time, and I will say that I trust him mm. in that respect. Um, and as far as Weta goes, I mean, yeah, you guys have you you know, and I'm sure Roko will will echo the same thing. Like they they're leaps and they're doing such incredible things, and um, and the technology is only they're pushing it even further. And Cameron as a director is all always been on the forefront of new technology and he knows how to use it whereas some other directors maybe have the tools but don't exactly know how to build with them so um you know i think i think uh it's going to be interesting when it finally does come out but yeah it's going to be a spectacle nonetheless roca you do nothing if not build with tools what do you think <laughs> of the story <laughs> yeah no i love this story because like we've mentioned war for the planet of the apes it that inspired me to write my first column for a tracking board because i was like you got to nominate any circus because the the amazing technology that they're able to bring to life when you're watching that movie. Steve Zahn almost steals the movie, yeah. and I haven't seen him steal a movie in a long time. Yeah, Steve Zahn's great, man. Yeah. Saving yeah. Silverman. The O'Netters. Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. That was for you, Cody. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but his his the work they did with his ape is phenomenal. And you forget that you're watching 
uh, digital effects. You, you, you invest so deeply, and it's because of Weta's advancement technology, how far they come, leaps and bounds, year to year, how incredible they are. So to me, this only makes, and you, you can go back and watch Avatar, and Avatar is kind of dated in their technology. So you can only imagine how much more uh, effective and believable they'll be in creating the Navi and other species, because James said he is going to expand the universe. So there'll be other planets involved here, other species. So that only gets me more and more excited to see what he can do. And I don't mind that he takes his time. Back in the early days of Malick, Malick took his, Terrence Malick took his time before he did films, took his time, and when they came out, they were amazing. So you gotta let artists breathe and do that. And he's got billions, so he's in no rush, like Clark said. But you gotta give him time to create his stuff, because I think we're all gonna be better for it if you let him take his time and don't rush him. Let me add uh, one thing. I think <clears throat> you brought up a good point. Like, yeah. he's in no rush, and Avatar, the first Avatar, if you look at it now compared to special effects now, right. might be a little bit dated. I think they're gonna do a, a new skin. Like, you know, video oh, games, yeah. they do a, a new <laughs> release. They, hey, now in 4K with like added extra crystals or whatever. So I think they're gonna <laughs> reskin and re render all of Avatar. Wow. And that would make perfect sense because then you could release the very first yeah. Avatar so that it's the 10 year anniversary yeah. and then two, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. So that would be a, that would be smart if they were listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> Which of course they are. Hi, Mr. Cameron. Hi, Good Jim. luck with hey. your little movie there. <laughs> Let's move on to movies that are actually opening soon. We can all go watch together. What do we got, Ash? It's the Dark Tower. Roland Deshane Idris Elba, the last gunslinger, is locked in an eternal battle with Walter O'Dim, Matthew McConaughey, also known as the Man in Black. The gunslinger must prevent the Man in Black from toppling the Dark Tower, the key that holds the universe together what the fate of the world with the fate of worlds at stake two men collide in the ultimate battle between good and evil Ashley, you didn't sound that excited. I mean, we're talking about the world here. <laughs> I we're was very about, excited. You know, with the world at stake, and there's like a fate, and there's like a battle the between good and evil. The fate of world at stake, there's okay. multiple worlds, multiple worlds. are at stake here, guys. <laughs> the only thing keeping us from destruction is... Is Idris Elba, and I like those <laughs> odds. I do. The way that he loads a gun is really cool in the trailer. Um, I'm excited about The Dark Tower. I'm not hearing great things about the post-production process. I'm hearing a lot of stuff about test screenings and that they, they didn't do so well. And there's a, a group of us are going to see it tomorrow night. I will not be able to see The Dark Tower at the press screenings. I'll be hosting Schmoes No Live, having a ball with you guys. Clark Wolf, you are going to go see it tomorrow yes. with some guy named Christian Harloff. Who I do not like, by the way. We do not get along at all. Well, that is not breaking news. <laughs> but tell us, do you think the Dark Tower has any shot of uniting you guys and becoming friends again? You know, um, I, I still have hopes that I will enjoy this movie. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have hopes that it will be good. But, like, like, you know, there are some movies that are actually good, and then there are some movies that you know are not good, but you're like, that was fun, and I had a great time. Um, I love Idris Elba. I love Matthew McConaughey. The thing that bums me out about the negative buzz about this is that the cast is great. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. these two guys are so great for for these roles and um so it would be a drag if they sort of squandered that uh but i have high hopes that i'm gonna have fun with it and um you know christian is always i've always said that i'm the gunslinger to his <laughs> to his man in black so um so you know hopefully it'll be a, a good time we'll be had by all i like christian as a man in black he did one time shoot a guy in reno just to watch him die <laughs> john roca you looking at the dark tower i mean yeah. there's so much source material that you can you can make a franchise off these movies and unlike times when when you see a, a, a film launch and they say, don't worry, we have six more ideas for this. And you're like, whatever. There's already the ideas are on paper. And now this Dark Tower movie is actually expanding from Stephen King's lore and going in a different new direction for fans of the book or people like me who have never bothered reading anything. Do you think this is going to be a worthwhile endeavor or as Clark Wolf would say, good? Uh, I think I'll go with Clark Wolf on this because of all the buzz you're hearing about it. It's only a 90 minute. We've been waiting decades yeah. for this as some of us who grew up with Stephen King books as they were coming out. Dark Tower was one of those ones that you held like precious, like it or the stand. You held that to your breast because it was so great. So to see that you waited decades for this to come out and it's only 90 minutes and you hear all this bad production and you're right, Clark, there's great actors involved. You were excited. Then you see that first trail and you're like, hey, 
okay, we'll see what happens. So I don't hold out a lot of hope, but I'm still going to go make up my own mind. And hopefully there's something to take out of it that they can build and do a next one and really bring that world to life in the way that's uh, uh, that honors what Stephen King created. You know you're supposed to read books and not nurse them. <laughs> <laughs> John Schnapp. Yeah. What did you do with books when you were a youth? Uh, I read them. Um, <laughs> I did. I didn't nurse the stand. I read it and then had nightmares, um, which is how you're supposed to. That's what you're supposed to do when you read horror yeah, books. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is uh, something that begins with a G. It's garbage. Uh, that's what it feels oh, like. Whoa. Yikes! Uh, none Hang of the tra- on. none of the trailers have looked good to me. I think both of the actors in it are top notch quality actors. If you like Idris Elba, watch Luther. I mean, I yeah. feel like Matthew McConaughey's got a lot of other films that you could watch that he's incredible in. 90 minutes, and this is like, remember they're talking, Ron Howard was like, we're going to make this movie, yeah. and then we're going to have a series, a TV show, and then make another movie. They have this entire plan that looks like it was jettisoned to have the most simplistic, sloppy, garbage film. I can't even begin to tell you how, how and I haven't seen the film yet, but judging from the trailers, it looks like it's got that G word all around it. So uh, Holly wants to see it because she knows it's going to be that good kind of garbage. So I'm like, mm. I'm, I am going to see it. If McConaughey goes full McConaughey as a bad guy, that's worth the price of admission. But see, I don't even think they're going to let that. that that's what I mean. And it's such a, it feels like yeah. such a bad movie that they didn't even let anybody do anything. Oh, easy, easy. We yeah. don't want to offend. Yeah. It's that smooth globule of garbage. Very you know? restrained McConaughey, at least from the trailers. Yeah. But again, like, it, you know, if it is not a good movie, but you get to see McConaughey like what Al Pacino did in The Devil's Advocate and just go like full, just like big, big hammy performance. And I think it'd be worth it. But that's like, I'm still looking forward to the movie, okay? I'm not letting anybody be a downer. And if you don't want to see The Dark Tower, there are other good movies out there. You can go watch Dunkirk for a visceral war experience, or you can check out Girl's Trip. I finally saw it last night. It is hilarious. Woo-hoo. Let's move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley's going to give us a premise. We'll say whether we buy it or sell it, and then yell at each other for a little bit. What's up first? It looks as though Blade Runner 2049 will be adding another prestigious composer to the already stacked list. Revealed in a recent interview via the film Music Reporter, director Denny Villeneuve confirmed that Hans Zimmer is now working on the score alongside a cure for wellness and comp- upcoming IT composer Benjamin Walfish. Sicario and Arrival composer Composer Johan Johansson, who originally signed on to score the film, is still involved on the project, with Villeneuve saying that they are maintaining the theme written by him. It's still unclear what led to this change so close to the October 6th release date. Roka, buy or sell Hans Zimmer doing work on Blade Runner 2049. Oh, this is, I okay, I buy it, but maybe 51% buy it, because... This late in the process really unsettles me. And nothing about the music and the score they used in the trailers that have been released made me feel like they don't capture the vibe of the original. So this concerns me a little bit because Zimmer is more of a bombastic composer. Things are sweeping and large epics and very big. And even his Man of Steel one, it's very powerful, but it's like large, you know? Now, back you go back in the 80s, he did do Black Rain. He's done synthesizer work back in his 80s stuff. So maybe he'll go back to that and maybe they needed a little more. Maybe uh, Johan Johansson was wasn't quite getting there, and Benjamin Walfish, who worked with Zimmer on the Dunkirk score, so they have a relationship. Maybe uh, uh, Villeneuve saw some, some things were missing, needed to bring somebody in who's a little more professional, a little more on top of the stuff that he wanted to get done. And also there's rumors that Johansson has do, is doing three movies at once right now and maybe got overwhelmed sure. and so had to kind of pull away from the topics so was, uh, from the movie. So to respect it, they brought in Zimmer to kind of maybe, uh, you know, like kind of sand down the edges a little bit and really bring this thing home. So I am buying it, but I'm a little concerned this late in the process to bring in a composer who's so starkly different from what uh, Johansson did in Arrival and Prisoners and Sicaria. So it, it makes me a little worried. That's all. Yeah, I mean, because I want this thing to be as so good. As far as like, like classic composer names go, if you have to replace somebody named Johan, I'm glad it's with somebody named Hans. And <laughs> I, like Benjamin Walfish is my question mark in all this because he's been working on the movie as well. Yeah. So I, I think I think with Johan, the, the big thing is that he has a composing style that has been noted in the past to blur the line between a score and sound design. So mm-hmm. if you want something that is more like your overarching film theme kind of thing, then you might want to bring in somebody who's a little bit more classical in the movie sense to do that line of work. But 
you, don't you have Benjamin Walfish doing this, mm, who's yeah. also been working on like it and a cure for wellness? So now you need somebody else. So it does seem like a lot of cooks in the kitchen. But you know, Roka, we're, we're big sports fans here. Yeah. So if you have to bring in a seasoned KG veteran to clean up whatever is going on in the playing field, then you want somebody like a Hans Zimmer, who clearly has an incredible track record. So if there is a replacement needed, I think Hans Zimmer is a mm. good name. How about you, Schnepp? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know how the Oscars work is you can only be one composer. If you have two, you can't be nominated. So I'm not really worried about that. I think they're bringing in Hans Zimmer to, like you said, like maybe add another theme or mm -hmm. add, because the, the film right now is what I'm hearing, the rough, the, the not even the rough cut, the final cut is 245, wow. two hours and 45 <gasps> minutes. And they're like, you think oh. just the arms are getting tired? Like, well, no, I just think <laughs> I feel like, I mean, and the, all the things that we've heard so far from the trailers have a Vangelis uh, undertone mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them are straight up like kind of like Daft Punk meets Vangelis. Yep. So I, I don't know if that's a special thing made only for the trailer or if that's actually part of either of these two guys' mm -hmm. themes or what they're working with. I don't know if they made a special deal with Vangelis. You can use this, but you can't use that. I don't know what's going on. Right. But I love Hans Zimmer. And I think, you know, especially when he's working in tandem with other people and he's brought in to be like the specialist, like, you need to tackle this. You need to tackle the Tyrell's, you know, the Tyrell theme. We need some, we need some juice right here. That's the guy to get. So I don't have any problems with that. Hundred percent buy. Okay. Clark Wolf. Yeah, I think um, you know it's a. I'll buy it. It's a. He's a prestigious, prestigious name, and um, I think the studio is taking this movie really seriously. As far as the, you know, any complications behind the scenes, at the end of the day, Den Denny Villeneuve, this is his a dream project, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it just shows that he's invested in the process and is going to do everything he can to make sure it is perfect. And you know, at the end of the day, if you're going in and fixing things, fix it. Fix it before it comes yeah. out. Like, yeah, totally. who cares? I mean, I, I understand, like, it, it would be worrisome to maybe some fans, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think that Denny, Denny Villeneuve will, will take this very seriously. You know what's worrisome is that they were making a sequel to Blade Runner. Exactly. That was, when we first heard about it, I was like, <laughs> what the hell is Alcon all about, these yeah. idiots? And then they get Denny Villeneuve, who, like, on record is like, this is my favorite film mm -hmm. of all time. I took this job because I didn't want anyone else to F it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that guy is like, you know, and then you look at his track record, all of his films. I mean, he's such a great director, filmmaker. Mm -hmm. He's got a, an amazing DP. Roka and I were at Hall H, yeah. saw that incredible presentation. I feel a lot better now having seen all that kind of stuff as being like Blade Runner is one of my favorite films of all time. Right, Mark Ellis? <laughs> I'll see it. I'll see it before the, the new one comes Good God. And, and you guys might be right because... There is thumping to the original score. If you go right. back and listen to the original, there are these do, 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 do. So maybe Zimmer, that's where Zimmer's going to lay the groundwork to mm -hmm. do those because he has an affinity to do these larger uh, thumping scores. So maybe that's where they brought him in to bring that edge back to right. the original stuff that Vangelis had or Vangelis had in the first one. Yeah. All right, let's move from thumping to scary with a new trailer <laughs> for a movie called Mother! Paramount Pictures, <laughs> Paramount Pictures <laughs> has released. I like the exclamation point. You can really feel it there. Mother! Paramount yeah. Pictures has released a new <laughs> teaser trailer for Mother, the new horror movie directed by Darren Aronofsky and starring Jennifer Lawrence and Javier Bardem. The movie tells the story about a couple's relationship becoming tested when uninvited guests arrive at their home, disrupting their tranquil existence. The movie also stars Ed Harris, Michelle Pfeiffer, Domino Gleeson, Brian Gleeson, and Kristen Wiig, and is set to hit theaters on September 15th. Clark, buy or sell the first teaser for Mother. I definitely buy the first teaser for Mother! Um, <laughs> I, I really like this, and I can't wait for the full trailer. Um, I, You know, Aronofsky, when... He goes dark and sort of gets into that, you know, genre blendy world like he did with Black Swan. I'm totally into it. Um, I, I like this tease. I like, I, I, oh, I love the poster with uh, Jennifer Lawrence just holding this heart ripped out of her own. I mean, it's just weird. And at the end of the day, when you have A-listers like Javier Bardem and Jennifer Lawrence and Michelle Pfeiffer and Ed Harris getting weird, Sign me up. I'm mm -hmm. I'm all about it. So, <clears throat> bye, big bye. I'm I'm all about it too. But like the the 45 seconds we saw was just <laughs> like what am I buying? Crazy. Here? I know. I, I I'm 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 still on the fence. I, I it was a definite sell before Clark made her pitch. So I'm closer to buying it now. <laughs> Schnapp, which side are you going on? 100 percent buy, Mark. Uh. Um, <laughs> all you got to say is Darren Aronofsky. I, I mean, look, I watched Noah and I liked it. Yeah. I mean, because it was like that had like rock creatures walking around. I mean, it was like. That's some craziness, and it's still enjoyable. Why? Because Darren Aronofsky has that energy as a director. He can take you through a different world. Going into the horror world of Black Swan and now this, yeah, 
I didn't really even need to see a trailer. I was going to see it. Poster looks great. Looks like a crazy, freaky, psychological thriller. And I always think of the police song, Mother. Mother! Are uh, you thinking Mother. of the police song, Mother? Yeah, not Danzig. What? Thinking of Danzig. Danzig. Yeah. Tell your children not to walk Roka's way. What do you think? Mother. mother. The guy lifts a lot of weights, Danzig. <laughs> Listen, uh, the, I, I, I love this uh, trailer as an Aronofsky. Because like you, I went to see Noah. Aronofsky, I don't, I, he's never done wrong in my eyes. I've, right. I've enjoyed everything. It is. I even bought Noah because I liked what it's he did with it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed what he And Russell was great in that film. Uh, so, so to me, this excites me because it's another, like you said, Clark Black Swan type, like pushing the boundaries of what you can handle watching in the hands of a master. You know, I always say, like, I'm not a massive horror guy, but when the masters get involved, I like to watch their work mm -hmm. because they really push the genre and use the media in its right form. Um, my only concern is this. Bardem is 21 years older than Jennifer Lawrence, so we're no. going to accept that they're husband and wife. That worries me a little bit. So, But I'm a massive fan of Bardem and Jennifer Lawrence and everyone else that's in this cast, so I'm excited to see what Aaron Aronofsky can do with them. Maybe there's a little... Uh, I mean, just hearing her screams and then the shock. There's a picture of her that looks like Jennifer is really like scared out of her mind, and that makes me uh, more excited to see a film that's going to scare me. We should all go with Josh McCuga, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Sit next to him while he watches this yeah. movie. All right, so three vibes on the table. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> Go with your instinct. I'm, I'm, I gotta sell. I gotta be honest oh. with you guys. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see enough from the Ashley Movie. You got a chance to watch the mother teaser, right? Are, are you I with did, me? I did, and I feel it? like people are gonna give me shit too because I'm selling it. Yeah. I watched oh. it. I got you, girl. Yeah, it's okay. I, I got, got you. Girl. Haters Corner, Haters as usual. Corner. We watched it and we we're like, what the hell was that? And when I heard, when we first read the premise a while ago on Movie Talk, I was like, oh great, Jennifer Lawrence in a horror movie. That's all I'm gonna see. And again, in this teaser, that's all I saw. Jennifer Lawrence looked like she was gonna bust into some modern dance routine, looking for a door. And there's things like yelling in the background. And then Kristen Wiig is a part of this cast. What is she gonna pop up out of the door and be like, hey guys, I'm unexpected guest. I can't imagine her like as a part of this cast. So she I saw that. She's the target lady in this. I don't know if you know, she's actually playing the target lady. And she just comes in and brings. I can't picture it. I just can't picture it. <laughs> Wendy, you feel the same way? I do. I got to go with my girl over here. We both, I watched it first, and then I was like, I don't know what I just saw. And then yeah. I showed it to her, and she was like, what was that? So here's the thing is, I like the premise, and I like Aronofsky, and I really loved Black Swan, so I have no doubt that this movie is totally up my alley, and I'm going to like it. But for this topic, the buyer, I'm selling it. I just, I didn't, we didn't see enough. All I heard was Jennifer Lawrence screaming, mother, or whatever, murder, is what she <laughs> screamed. Yeah, and I'm like... All right, so she's screaming this movie like she does in every movie. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do want to see the movie. Don't get me wrong. But this this specific trailer just felt like it's like like you can't get away with this trailer unless it's a bunch of famous people in the movie. You're like, look at how famous this actress Easy. is. Easy. It's look not even a trailer. It's, it's a, quick it's a teaser. teaser. Haters Corner, relax. <laughs> Everybody, yeah. And it's, it's a teaser. You're not going to get a straight trailer from Aronofsky. You can't or believe this hate. I don't, uh, yeah, agreed. Murder! <laughs> Murder! Murder! Hiring Hans Zimmer to it's replace like... all of you right now. <laughs> we are going to move oh, on true. to remind you guys that at the end of the show, we're going to save some time for your live yeah. Twitter questions. So go and start tweeting us at Collider Video. And I also want to remind you guys that later on today on Collider Video's YouTube channel, we have an all new movie trivia schmodown match. It's an inner geekdom between Rachel Cushing and Mike Kalinowski. <laughs> and boy, what a matchup it is going to be. It's the first of a handful of or Geekdoms we're going to be having this month, and it all leads up to somebody getting to challenge Hector Navarro for that fabled belt that everybody wants to get their hands on. So make sure you guys check that out later today on the channel. We also are going to have a new live daily TV talk hosted by the one, the only Joshua Hercules Makuga. It's been going live <laughs> daily each day this week, and that's not the only show that is live daily this week. Well, it's daily, and it's about comic books. And it involves heroes oh, and our own yeah. hero, John Schnapp. That's right. Check it out. It's coming on at 1 o'clock today. We had a Thrones talk hosted by Ken Knapsack, Rachel Cushing and Company, dropped yesterday. And, oh, are you on that? Yeah, I'm on that, Mark. Oh, good. Okay, well, congratulations <laughs> on all your success in your career. We also have, going back to John Schnapp, a new comic book shopping is dropping very soon on the Collider YouTube channel. We got some Rick and Morty cast. We got yeah. Chris Parnell, yep. Sarah Chuck. That's going to yeah. be fun. Oh, they're great. It was so much fun hanging out with them at, uh, at the Meltdown comic book store. So check that out. That's going to be on later today. And I'm told once again to remind everybody that John Roca 
is on Thrones Talk. <laughs> oh, stop That's it. right. That's what the teleprompter says. Oh, my God. Make sure you guys check out Awesome Tacker with Jeremy Johns each and every Friday. A new episode drops. You guys can catch the link to the latest one in this vid's description. And now let's move on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where you guys write us a letter. You drop us a line. You can do so anytime. Collidervideo at gmail.com is the address to use. We'll either answer it on our weekly movie talks or on our weekend show's Mailbag. Try to keep them original, fresh, and let's see what's in there today, Ash. Steve Anderson writes, hey, Collider crew, if you could change one thing in any movie, standalone or series, what would it be? Could be a plot point, casting change, etc. Mine would be not to kill off Darth Maul in The Phantom Menace and allow him to be alongside Darth Sidious throughout the prequels instead of Count Dooku. Thanks. That's a pretty damn good one you got there, Steve Anderson. Roca, your thoughts on being yep. able to have all the omnipotent power to change one <laughs> thing in a movie. This could be anything. What do you got? Uh, I push back a little bit on Steve. Would you have enjoyed Clone Wars? Darth Maul was a great part of bringing him back and what we saw in Rebels, so I disagree with you completely. But my my choice... <laughs> That's uh, why we have you on this show. <laughs> ...is uh, uh, replacing Sofia Coppola in Godfather 3. That's my number one thing. Mm. Um, there, I, I, I was around when this thing came out. I'm a massive Godfather fan. She ruins the movie. Every scene she's in, she's absolutely terrible, and it kills the film. So for me, I would replace her. Uh, Laura San Giacomo was in contention. Alabella Shiora was in contention. Winona Ryder had signed on, then had to pull out to do Mermaid because she had done Mermaids. Hey, don't <gasps> you knock Mermaids. <gasps> mermaids is an American classic. Yeah, Damn Cher, it. Cher, Bob Hoskins, good stuff. Christina Godfather, Ricci. Mermaids, Godfather. Godfather 3, <laughs> Godfather son. 3, fair, exactly. <laughs> and I think Winona would have killed Godfather 3. She'd have been amazing. Uh, the, Julia Roberts was in contention. A lot of people don't know this. She was in contention for the film. And Madonna, of all people. So uh, I think there were a lot of better choices they could have gone with. So that would be in the, the I movie. like the, uh, the Annabella uh, Shorey. Yeah, she's that, a great choice. Been, yeah. But let me throw you this. If Sofia Coppola didn't do, wasn't in that, yeah. would she have then gone on to, like, and then ridiculed for being in that film, yeah, being yeah. a bad actress in that film, would she have then gone on to be such an amazing director that she is now it could have changed her oh. entire life and that butterfly ripple effect read sound of thunder well, um you so know you're saying that would have been like jordan never getting cut from his high school yeah and then we would have game. never got those movies scarlett johansson would have never gotten that role mm. with bill murray all these things would have happened and we'd live in a different world thanks a lot roca <laughs> you're, you're destroying God. my dreams <laughs> Well, I can't wait to hear your snap. Let's right. do it. What is your snap? All right, mine's totally ridiculous. <laughs> Thelma and Louise Ooh. go off the cliff and then a parachute. What? They, they, they oh, survive. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> 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 just destroyed the feminist movement completely yeah. in one <laughs> Films. I, I, I kind of like that parachute. Clark, where are you going on this uh, question? So uh, I recently, if you follow me on Twitter, saw that I was uh, live tweeting watching War of the Worlds, Steven Spielberg's War oh, of the yeah. Worlds. I love Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. Mm -hmm. I think it is excellent. I think it has held up so much. However, and I'm not anti-Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise was horribly miscast Ooh. in that movie. He, you know, the whole, his character is a deadbeat dad. He's kind of like a scruffy, like, you know, rough around the edges kind of guy. I think he's even a mechanic. And I'm like, dude, Tom Cruise is not a mechanic. <laughs> Especially <laughs> Tom Cruise, like, 10 years ago. I mean, right. it's not like he was like maverick or risky business or whatever, like where he's a young hotshot where like the audience looks at him and goes like, oh man, that's an everyman, but just like slightly cooler. Like, that's awesome. No, this is Tom Cruise, like movie star Tom Cruise. And um, I felt like it was a huge distraction. And I also felt like the kids were excellent. The movie is great, but that, that really necessary relationship and flawed father uh, part of the character just never quite comes through. Um, and similarly felt that way. I know the mummy had a lot of problems, oh, but yeah. like Tom Cruise was horribly yeah, miscast I was with in you that, on that as Absolutely. well. You know? yeah. So like, yeah, yeah, that's mine. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I wanted to go with, like a happier note here, so I, I don't want to down anybody too much. So I was going to go with like, like, like the government catching E.T. I think that would have been a great like alternate <laughs> ending. Um, I think that oh, we could have no. had like, you know, th there's just some things in movie like maybe the dog and Marley and me uh, uh, was saying goodbye to Owen Wilson. So the other way around, like, like we're putting Owen Wilson's character to rest instead mm. of uh, then the dog gets to walk out of the clinic. And that would have been a better ending. Um, but the one that I will stick with and, and it's kind of taking a note of, of some of you guys is miscasting opportunities is I love the guy. I'm a fan of his entire career. I love everything from Point Break to The Matrix to Speed to John Wick. Don't get Keanu Reeves in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yes. 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 Take a hike. Yes. You weren't ready, kid. Oof. You weren't ready. Oof. You, you no. had your shot at the show. No. You, you, you weren't ready. We, we got to send you back down to the monitors. We're going to mm. put up somebody else in there. I don't know who I would have put in there instead. I just, yeah. I know that, that you could have put 
Tom Cruise. Literally. Literally. Tom, Tom Cruise. Cruise. Anybody. Literally, Literally anybody. anybody. Else. Love never dies, except when you see that that cast. That's right. Know. I mean, look, if I'm watching Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, I'm like, ah, let's go with Alex Winter to play Jonathan Harker right. over Keanu Reeves. So it just kind of <laughs> takes me out of the movie. But otherwise, great flick. So that was a uh, that was a fun question. Yeah. Sorry, Roki yelled at you. We enjoyed it. <laughs> All right, let's move on to some live Twitter questions before we close up shop here. Wendy, what are they saying out there in Twitter? This one, first one comes from K. Lewis Bigelow, who writes, because of everyone's reaction to the Emoji movie, is there any other film that genuinely left, uh, had you leaving the theater angry? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think we've all left the theater angry yeah. sometimes, and that's, uh, like, like, that's kind of the premise as to why at least I like to do what I do when I talk about a movie is because it costs $10, $15 just for the ticket. You're paying for popcorn parking. If you go on a date, you're, you're spending a lot of money at a movie, so you don't want to leave angry. There's been a number of movies that have really really pissed me off. The first G.I. Joe was one of them. The <laughs> G.I. Yes. Joe, The Rise of Cobra. I, I don't even know if I made it through the whole movie. I just remember mm. walking home from the Grove to my apartment that was by the Beverly Center. So it was a good mile walk, and I was just thinking about my entire life. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it really does some, some self-reflecting is what happens after I get angry at a movie, Clark. Uh, I got It Comes at Night. Um, that movie is terrible really uh, wow. i think it is terrible and it's not a false advertising thing yes i do agree that they advertise that movie completely wrong um but i think it is flimsy i think it is weak and i think mm. that ending is a complete cop out like there there are some movies that are artistic and oh i ask questions but i don't <laughs> answer them and i get it like that's great and that should happen in genre more uh, but It Comes at Night just completely quit. It was like, nope. And I won't say why because it's spoilery, mm. but the ending of that movie completely contradicts everything about Joel Edgerton's character up until that point. And we don't have a conversation about what happens. Nonsense. Wow. Nonsense. Flimsy. <laughs> I say weak. nonsense. And the ending is a cop out. Rocco, what do you got? Two films. Uh... Phantom Menace. Two films have ever wanted me to take a concrete bat to wooden to wooden walls. That was Phantom Menace. Just so much anger walking home at college, back to the door. Just anger. The first time you saw it. Yeah, first time yeah. I saw it. This Jar Jar Binks thing. Oh my God. Watto as well. All of it. Just it drove me insane. Yeah, come on. What? You don't have problems with Watto and <laughs> all the other racist? stereotypes? Come on. <laughs> no, it's a, I'm flying around. What is wrong? Don't look at my nose. Oh, yeah. ridiculous. And then uh, Batman and Robin. Oh, mm. I have. I still mm. have yet to finish. Yeah. The last hour of that movie. As soon as Alicia Silverstone does that motorcycle race, I'm like, get the f out! I, I walk right out the theater, did you, and I've did never you, walked out. That was the first film I've walked out of. I walk right out of there. I've never seen it since. I was wow. like scanning channels the other day, flipping channels, and I caught that dinner scene between Clooney and whoever that model was who was acting at the time. El McPherson. El McPherson. And I was like, I, w I walked out at the right time. This thing is a piece of garbage. Yeah. And I loved Clooney, loved Clooney because of ER and everything. I was so happy to see him as, be as Batman. I thought he'd be a great Bruce Wayne, and it was crap. The good news is if you pay to see Batman and Robin with your Bat American Express, yeah. you got your money back. Uh, what do you got, Schnapp? I feel, I feel for you, man. <laughs> I, I saw all of it, so oh, you know, God. Don't, just don't ever see the I last won't. hour. Yeah, <laughs> never. Not worth it. Um, see the quick clips of all of Arnold's like chill, freeze. That's worth That's it. That's fun. Just watch the little YouTube yeah. cut down some sweaty made. Um, I walked out of Let's Be Cops. Oh, that came out like two yeah, years ago. Yeah. I was I was pre sold. <laughs> I was pre sold on the trailers. I was like, oh my God, this is so funny. It's got these two comedians that I really like. Yeah. Look, the trailer looked great, and then <clears throat> the movie's totally different. Sold me down the road, the different story, flat, I'll steal your word, flimsy. I love that. Uh, but, you know, I got to say, all these other critics liked It Comes. Oh, I know uh, they did. So, that's so, I, I know they like. I know they did. It's kind of making me want to see it now. Go see it. I, Go I would see recommend. It. I, I really liked It <laughs> Comes at Night. It. Wow. But I will say this, <clears throat> is that I think the trailer pretends to something different. Yes. But it also, another movie I walked out really angry afterwards was The Village. But after seeing it comes at night and being like, oh well, now I have this, you oh, know, yeah. auteur lens that I'm watching movies through that I can be, I can go back watch the village, and maybe appreciate it for what it actually was, as opposed to what the studio, not the filmmaker, what the studio was selling us. We on. we need to have a conversation, spoilery conversation after this because I'm telling you. That movie sucks with or without its trailers. I have a <laughs> feeling that conversation is going to end with you being like my personal trainer yesterday, saying you're flimsy, you're weak, oh. and the ending is a cop out. <laughs> Ashley, Wendy, do you guys have any movies that actually made you have a visceral anger afterwards? Um, I've had a few that made me angry, but um, I think 
in the sense of I was let down, Girl on the Train. I was really yes. let down. Oh, I was yeah. so Good excited words. about that. The book is amazing. So yes. I was just, I was let down by the execution because I thought it had a lot of potential, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same girl on the train most recently because the book was so good and then mm-hmm. I just, I ended up, I myself, a fan of the book, ended up making fun of the movie because it was just terrible. Yeah. And then the one that made me leave the theater angry, even though I didn't walk out, I should have walked out of it, Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, What a yeah, crap yeah, movie. What a, a crap adaptation. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It just it just goes to show you, kids, don't read the source material or watch the source material because it's only going <laughs> to let you down when you see the movie remake of it. All right, let's do one more Twitter question and call it a day. What do we got, Wendy? All right, this one comes from... Uh-oh, there he goes. Jesse, I'm not going to attempt that last name. Jesse writes, long-time listener, first-time tweeter. Behind-the-scenes <laughs> question, how much of the show do you guys read up the teleprompter? None. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, if we had a teleprompter Man, here, so I mean, thing let me smooth let scroll back a little bit. Scroll back. <laughs> Jesse Scrum Skim Skrillisis 1248. I don't read from the teleprompter. I am only saying things that are coming from my brain. <laughs> yeah, we actually don't have a teleprompter here in studio. There is a teleprompter floating around here somewhere that I think they use in uh, in our uh, Studio B yeah. for like the news and stuff because apparently news reporters need a teleprompter. I I've never needed a no. teleprompter, Roca. How no. about you? No, there's no teleprompter. The only thing is uh, wh- when Ashley or Natasha or Sinead host, they read what's there. It would or have been Wendy cool hosts, to have a teleprompter there. though. But there's no teleprompter, so. right? Exactly. So th- no, that would be ridiculous. We wrote our comments down ahead of time. We're like, here, type this in that doesn't make any sense you want a little bit more insight into how movie talk works there's two people up here at our desk that have computers out you know what they're looking at fantasy football updates (laughs) because that draft is right around the corner and getting closer all the time so thank you for giving us i guess the uh the the privilege of assuming that we are reading some of this off a teleprompter Mm. i think that makes me feel like we're doing our job well if people out there assume that the words are there for us you're right mark mark (laughs) ellis and don't forget i'm ron burgundy (laughs) 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 Sorry, it was on the teleprompter. I read whatever is on the teleprompter. That is going to do it here for us at Collider (laughs) Movie Talk. I read that right. I want to thank you guys for tuning in to another fun live show. Thank you to our crew, Adam and Cody, the birthday boy. Right, it was his birthday yesterday. Everybody relax. It's and, uh, it's 18. I want to thank everybody up here at the panel with me. First of all, the never weak, the never flimsy, the never ending on a cop out. John Schnapp, where can the kids find you? Well, you can scroll back a little bit <laughs> at Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can find me in, at John Snife. And also, I'm at Carmel, Indiana. I'm doing a filmmaking conference. Come check it out Friday, Saturday. Hang out with me in Carmel, Indiana this weekend and watch comic book shopping in Heroes later today. We have tried to find somebody who's doing a cooler city this weekend than Carmel, Indiana. <laughs> Las Vegas couldn't compete. Clark Wolf, where are you going to be? I'm going to be right here, Mark. Uh, and you can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and uh, download the Stardust app and find me there. I did a, rev- a review of the It trailer last week in ah. Georgie's Slicker. That they sent me, which was awesome. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, check me out. We're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff on there uh, for the next couple months. That it trailer, a lot scarier than Mother. What do we got, Roka? <laughs> hey, guys, you can always follow me at The Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram. We just dropped a new episode of the Top 10 Show this morning on the Schmoes No Plus podcast channel. Top 10 movies with a city in the title in honor of Catherine Bigelow's Detroit. I've got an Outlaw Nation podcast coming out every Thursday, uh, of course, here. Uh, Thrones Talk every Monday morning until the finale on Sunday night. And Today, I drop a new column on the tracking board, tracking-board.com, honoring Arnold Schwarzenegger on his 70th birthday. Woo-hoo. All right. Maybe just one plug for you next time. Let's move <laughs> on to <laughs> Nova. We're good. I'm a busy man. I'm a busy man. <laughs> you guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Ashley Melba. Happy Tuesday, guys. Oh, man, I'm afraid to plug anything. <laughs> Wendy, please, Amy, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. You, you guys did great. You can Mark, find me Mark, this Mark, weekend. I'll also be having <laughs> breakfast. Oh, okay. At- okay, good. You can find all of us here on the Collider <laughs> YouTube channel. I'll be hosting Schmoes No Live tomorrow night. And this weekend, I'll be at the Charlotte Comedy Zone. Will Roka come and open for me? Oh. <laughs> Get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. We will see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider. <laughs>